я укажу. И, и в сортире их замочим, в конце концов. Свобода лучше, чем не свобода. Крым и Севастополь возвращаются в родную гавань. Welcome to Infocom. In the new episode of Focus on Russia, our guest is journalist Neil Howard. Neil, thank you for accepting our invitation. Thanks so much for having me, Tigran. I would like to discuss some regional developments today. And I would like to start with this format known as 3 plus 3, uh, which has been promoted by Turkey, partly by Azerbaijan, and Russia also seems to be uh, quite fond of it. What's your view on this format? Well, the, the, I mean, the format itself is, uh, the, the, the beginnings of it, I think, were, you know, the, the obviously Turkey proposing it, I think, virtually in December last year, and then a number of times after that, and it was just Turkey for the first few months saying it, and it seemed to me like it was an obvious non-starter, you know, because Russia and Russia's already, uh, is already formally involved in the region in so many ways, uh, including through the, the Minsk group, but then, you know, by far is the strongest bilateral links with, um, with most countries in, the, in the, the South Caucasus, or at least has, you know, uh, very strong bilateral links with, uh, let's say, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and then other levers of influence as well. And so initially, when it was just Armenia, it was just Turkey suggesting it, I figured, it, it, you know, this is not going to go anywhere, and this is just Turkey making an attempt, uh, not very successfully, to propose its own way into the region formally for some sort of talks. And, you know, initially, uh, Turkey or Armenia shot it down. I think Russia rejected it at the start as well. And Georgia, of course, said, you know, we're, 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 we won't participate in, in it at all because we won't participate in a format with Russia. And so for a number of months, it seemed to, to go qu fairly quiet. And then suddenly in the last month or two, the last four, six weeks, it seems to have really made a comeback. And not only with Turkey pushing it, of course, but surprisingly, the, the Russians have made positive comments about it and Iran as well. And of course, you know, Azerbaijan is happy to do something like this with its close partner, uh, Turkey, playing a much bigger role because this has been one of the things that Azerbaijan has pushed for, and, as well as, as Turkey has, is for Turkey, its strong ally, to enter the, the negotiations process on Karabakh, or as, as Azerbaijan says, the Karabakh conflict is over, let's say the, the Azerbaijan-Armenia relationship. Uh, so it makes sense for them to want to do it, but I was much more surprised to see Russia being interested, showing interest in it, for, for the, the recent, let's say, six weeks. And I have some theories about that, but I in general, you know, I'm, su I'm surprised it made a comeback. Yeah, let's talk about this series. In my view, this is a regional initiative which uh, aims to push out all, all the powers which are not from this region, uh, creating a new format in this new multilateral world, which we are seeing uh, in the last few years. And I think that's why Russia is quite interested in that. What's your view on that? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good take on that. That's pretty, pretty close to mine as well. Um, and especially, let's say, you know, uh, Iran, of course, I, I think it's pretty clear to me why Iran would like to be involved because they're presently not involved in any way. And when they do you know, make attempts to get involved diplomatically in the Caucasus, it generally comes to nothing. I mean, they, they offer many times to host ceasefire talks or host negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and they're just you know, more or less ignored. Even they have to do something as showy as these massive military exercises they just did to get any attention. Um, and their, their leverage in the Caucasus is, in general, basically non-existent. So I think it's pretty clear why they would want to do it. And then for Russia too, I think uh, in that sense, you know, it's, it's a, a comfortable, I can see how it's a comfortable platform for Russia as well, because Russia has this, has developed this sort of working relationship with Turkey, but then also with Iran as well, uh, primarily through the, the lens of the Syrian conflict, where, you know, Russia and Iran have been operating there uh, 
uh, have, have cooperated in many ways, but also have very different ideas about what they think Syria should look like and what they, uh, what their ideal outcome for Syria would be and how they would like the conditions there to progress. And so they have more, they, they've, they've been working in direct cooperation there, but they have, despite their, their number of differences there, and then Russia has really come to this, understand, this sort of understanding with Turkey as well over the, let's say, the last five years. Uh, let's say since the, the shoot down of the Russian jet in Syria in, I think that was November 2015, uh, if I'm not mistaken, so that's six years. And since then, Russia and Turkey have reached this sort of uh, agreement that, you know, often takes them, in the, the, the specifics of it, often takes like a, a fair amount of violence to figure out, as we've seen in northwest Syria and in the last two, three years, and in Libya as well. But Russia and Turkey are very capable of, they, they, they speak the same language to each other, you know. They both understand that the other one that it respects a bit of force, requires a bit of force to be applied in these sorts of scenarios to, to, to come to terms with them and, you know, to make those deals. And it's a language, it's a sort of language that Russia, I think, is much more comfortable speaking than, you know, and has a much more opportunity to find common ground with, uh, as the, the Kremlin thinks, than they do with, let's say, the Minsk group or with France or the, the U.S. or, you know, European states more generally. So I can see it, a lot of why this would be uh, something that Russia would be pretty happy to engage with. Uh, yeah, I agree with that point. I think in Russian foreign policy thinking, there is a clear distinction with, between Turkey and other NATO member states. So they do not see Turkey as a NATO member state, but as an autonomous, um, quite independent regional power, uh, which presence can be tolerated, I would say. And also a great parallel between the Astana format, uh, the Syrian format. Uh, what do you think, can this if this format happens, this 3 plus 3 or 3 plus 2 format happens, uh, can it bring the Syrian dynamics or uh, the dynamics of the greater Middle East into the region of the South Caucasus? I mean, it's an interesting question. I think the, the last few months uh, of, of negotiations in the South Caucasus and the broader, let's say, geopolitical format have been really interesting in terms of not only this 3 plus 3 uh, format gaining some more traction, but then in terms of these talk about, you know, Northwest corridors and uh, the Indian foreign minister visiting here for the first time and uh, India and supporting, you know, the Iranian back, the, the, the project that Iran is very much uh, on board with to improve the, the, the road basically leading from the Armenia's southern border, Armenia's border with Iran, north to the, the Georgian border. And so we're seeing a lot of, you know, dynamics that I think have been really not present in this region since the, the, the fall of the, the Soviet Union that are, that are starting to play a role, that are still, you know, very much uh, underdeveloped and, and uh, still a, a lesser factor than the traditional sort of Russian or Minsk group role, let's say, with, with regards to Armenia, Azerbaijan, or you know, let's say like Russia, uh, the Russia versus West dynamic with, with regards to Georgia. Um, but these, these new processes are starting to emerge. And I, I, th I think it's still, you know, pretty distinct uh, between that and the, what's happening in the, let's say, the, the Arab world between Russia and Turkey, because that's just such a, a different arena, an arena that's, that's characterized, in my view, and this is, explains a lot of why, too, I think that it explains a lot of uh, Iran's lack of success in the Caucasus, too, and that, the, let's say, the Arab world, the Middle East, is something that's characterized by very weak or failed states, with, where state capacity is almost non-existent, or states just straight up do not have the ability to control their, their territory and, and administer it and govern it, versus Armenia, Azerbaijan, which is, you know, something where there's, there, these, are, these are two very functional states. It's something very different than Syria or Iraq or, or Yemen. And these, these sorts of arenas where, you know, that's, that's the sort of thing that Iran excels in, is, is, it utilize, is utilizing local non-state actors, militias in these sorts of countries and uh, different political factions to exercise power uh, either ad hoc, either de facto, or sometimes, you know, getting into parliament and doing it de jour as well. 
And so this is just a, it's such a different dynamic in that sense that, you know, you're not going to have, uh, there, there's not going to be Russia and Turkey backing different, you know, factions uh, on, within countries here for control of the, the state or different militias, you know, it's such a, a different world in that sense. But the, the overlap is really that the, there, there are competing, but is it sometimes overlapping interests for both of, uh, both are Russia and Turkey in the Caucasus. And then Iran to a lesser degree too. Iran still, I think, very much being a bit player in all this, a smaller player. But all three of them, they do have some, uh, they, they, they do have some past experiences and, and some past relationships and experience of working with, working with the relationship with each other in the Middle East that, that can be applied in some degree to the South Caucasus. Uh, let's talk a bit about Georgia's role in this process. We've seen uh, the statement from Foreign Minister Zalkaliani, uh, which wasn't uh, accepted well by the Georgian general public, expectedly. Uh, he said that Georgia might somehow get engaged in this process. Then, of course, the uh, other statements came, which basically refuted uh, the previous statement. Do you think, uh, is there a chance that Georgia gets drugged in this process? I mean, it is possible. Um, the the Zalkaliani statement I thought was you know, pretty non-committal. I mean, anything, anytime in Georgia you suggest engaging with Russia or cooperating with Russia in any way, it's a, a firestorm of an issue. And for, for Georgia Dream, the ruling party there is something that they've already you know, faced accusations of. It's the number one accusation that gets thrown at them by the opposition. So it's, it is a, a political firestorm for them. but. I, ha I have a, a much harder time seeing Georgia accept that, simply because you know, I, the, the, the Zalkaliani statement I, th I thought was uh, you know, basically just saying if, if there is going to be big outcomes from this, then we have to play some role in it. You know, we can't just watch it pass us by. But at the same time, you know, Georgia is such a, it, it, despite the, the political crises there of, let's say, the last three months with uh, the EU and US, which the current Georgian government has been having open, uh, open disagreements with, uh, Georgia is just so intrinsically, is, is just so tightly linked to the US and the EU. And the, that relationship, and especially the, the US relationship, the, the US defense and political relationship is so unshakable for them that, and I think for, for the U.S. as well, the U.S. is very, the U.S. Is, is, is happy to give the administration in Georgia, whoever it is, a lot of leeway so long as they're actively anti-Russian and, you know, sort of a, 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 a U.S. ally in the region, a democratic U.S. ally in the region, that I think that there is very little will or uh, benefit for either Georgia or the let's let's say it's Western partners as well, the EU or, or, or US, and joining in on this, and because joining in on this for it, it, or at least at least let's say uh, actively participating in this and saying that we agreeing to allow the, the the formation of this three plus three format as a, a new framework for the region, it means automatically uh, either issuing a big challenge to the, the current. Uh, dynamics you have in, in Georgia versus Russia, with the with the, and the Georgia's two own separatist conflicts, with you know the the Geneva process as they've had there for many years, and so for and of course it means cutting out Georgia's strongest allies, which are the U.S. and EU in this process, and taking on and in, in their place replacing them with Iran, which is you know not particularly involved. But then Turkey as well, which Turkey has been a very vocal supporter of Georgia and a very, um, a, a very loyal uh, proponent of, of Georgia's NATO integration and increasing exercise with Georgia and everything, but still is you know, a much more, I think, untested partner and less dependable and less, less useful, frankly, to, to Georgia than the U.S. is. Uh, yeah, but pragmatically speaking, if all these communications are unblocked, uh, if communication between Russia and Armenia is happening through the territory of Azerbaijan, uh, isn't Georgia a net loser in this situation? I mean, definitely it is. In that, if, if we can imagine that circumstance where 
let's say there, there is the unblocking of physical links and trade does start to flow between ultimately Russia and Turkey via Armenia and Azerbaijan, then yes, that Georgia is the, a huge loser in that. Uh, because of course, right, right now their status as a transit country is extremely valuable to them. But I think we are so far away from that being a reality. I mean, just to even reach the basic steps of this process of unblocking anything, let alone everything, between Armenia, Azerbaijan, and then, you know, as a result of that, Turkey and Russia. I mean, here we are, we are, what, all, over 11 months now, almost one year now from the November 10th trilateral agreement last year. And there has been zero progress that has made. Nothing has been reopened, despite the fact that Russia has reiterated this at every at every stage. Uh, other partners have reiterated it. Other Azerbaijan has, has had its own attempts to, to force the issue as well. Uh, and this it will take so long to accomplish anything like this that I I think we we have to get some sort of any progress, tangible progress on the ground, but, but before we can start thinking about, you know, the the potential effects of this uh, at step 100 of the process when we're, we're barely on, you know, step one or two right now. Um, and what do you think, what's behind Georgia's latest um, diplomatic activiz activization in the region? We've seen that uh, Prime Minister Garibashvili visited Baku, then Yerevan, he made some statements. Um, Georgia is talking about um, uh, how it's called, I, I don't re remember the exact wording, but peaceful neighborhood or something like that. Uh, what, what are the motivations, what are the drivers of this process? I mean, I think Georgia really just, uh, for as far as the Karabakh conflict is, they go well out of their way to maintain good relations with both Armenia and Azerbaijan and just try to do everything in their power to avoid getting dragged in. And I, I think a, a good indicator of this is the fact that Georgia in general, I think enjoys quite strong state on state relations with Armenia, despite the fact that uh, uh, Azerbaijan is a, a much more important energy partner for, for Georgia and of course energy transit. And then, of course, Georgia ultimately sees the Karabakh conflict through the lens of its own separatist conflicts with Abkhazia and South Ossetia and the, every, the entire geopolitical orientation of Georgia being focused, being seen through the lens of Russia is the aggressor that's occupied our lands. And so they largely just flip that and see, oh, and see ultimately, you know, uh, Armenia has just done the same sort of thing and Armenia is friends with Russia. And, but despite all of that, uh, I think Georgia does maintain very quite good state relations with Armenia, as as evidenced by, you know, the the very regular trips back and forth by leadership of both countries from one to the other, and so I think in in terms of this, I expect very little to actually come out of it. You know, not only even if Georgia had the political will to do this without just being consumed by their own internal political crises, uh, I think that their ability to bring the two sides together and genuinely accomplish something is pretty limited. But outside of that, I think that the main, their main reason in suggesting these sorts of things and working closely with both sides is to maintain those favorable relations and do what they can to at least stop the, the, the conflict or the, the relationship between Armenia and Azerbaijan from degrading even further, to, which is something that you know, is, can only be to their detriment. Yeah, and my last question is about uh, U.S. position on this issue. Uh, the Defense Secretary declared his negative uh, evaluation of the 3 plus 3 format in Tbilisi. Uh, will there be any practical steps from the US to somehow, I don't know, hijack this process or stop this process? I mean, I do think the US is making, uh, they, 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 they have been increasingly active in, you know, reiterating the role of the Minsk Group and uh, since the, the, the Biden administration came to power, uh, they've been a lot more active uh, on the ground with you know, the diplomats uh, here and in Karabakh and also the, both the, the Secretary of State and then the National Security Advisor calling repeatedly uh, both to Yerevan and Baku and becoming involved in, more involved, more actively involved in this process. And I do think it's interesting that we've seen uh, sort of a walk back from Azerbaijan in the last few months uh, with their regards to their rhetoric towards the Minsk group, which is something that 
Aliyev was so openly dismissive of back in December and January and the, the Minsk group co-chairs visited Baku uh, around that time and he said to them, I don't know why you're here. We, uh, you, 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 you wanted to come, but I don't know what, what the purpose is because the conflict's over and there's, there's no need. We, we resolved that Minsk group was useless, just, uh, just justified, just enshrined the, the occupation and now it's over. And now we see in the last month or so that he started to say, you know, we're, we're all ready to engage in this. And there is this disconnect between that, that's emerged between Azerbaijan for many months after the November last year saying Karabakh conflict is completely over, which they do still say in some, in some degrees and in some circumstances. But then also they say, you know, we're willing to, we, we must continue negotiations on this and we will go to these other international formats. And so I think with that coming back into the picture, you know, it makes it a lot more uncertain as to what the potential future of this three plus three would be. Because I think six months ago, it would have been, uh, it's, it's, if you looked at the situation six months ago in terms of where the Minsk group was at then and how visible it was, it was much lower than, than now, I think. And there still has not been that much the, uh, tangibly accomplished, but there were, were the Armenian and Zeri foreign ministers met each other for the first time since the war in the last month as well, too. And that was, I believe, in Moscow. But again, in a process that's closer to the, the Minsk group established format already. So I think that there's some, some interesting dynamics going on there, too, that uh, I wouldn't have expected, let's say, six months ago. And I think that this is something that the U.S., it, both publicly and behind the scenes, is continuing to push forward as, with, through different methods as the only acceptable way to reach compromise on Armenia and Azerbaijan relations. Yeah. Neil, thank you for an interesting conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.